Okay, here we go. Everybody gets so chatty when it's Kathy's birthday. Oh, did I say that out loud? Uh, no, when there's no music in the morning because they were practicing with the kids, everybody's getting chatty. That's good. It's good, good to hear that everybody's friendly and not uh, at each other. That's always a good thing in a, in a family like ours here. So, uh, welcome. Glad you could be with us this morning. I'm glad we didn't get ice this morning yet. Um, hopefully, it'll just be a little snow if we get anything. And the forecast looks better the last time I checked for this week, too. So hopefully it stays that way. Um, everybody's been asking, how did the puzzle competition go yesterday? Uh, I thought it went really well. I was playing with my boys. So uh, me and Noah did really good, and Jackie and Ezra did good, and we had a, we had a great time. Um, if you ask all the others, they may not be as happy or think it was as joyful uh, as we did. But... Uh, yeah, they had a puzzle where the picture didn't match the puzzle. The picture on the box was different from the puzzle. Uh, and so I don't think any of them liked that very well. Uh, I won't share any results. I'll let them share that. Uh, they're kind of Everybody's kind of continuing a trend in the wrong direction, though I will say that much. So, But uh, I think it's still fun. I really appreciate it in the community. I like that that's done, and, and we like puzzles, so it works out well. So I hope that continues to go strong for years to come. Uh, today, uh, you can support the firemen uh, with breakfast from 8 to 12.30 in Armour there. So if you're hungry after the service, I encourage you to go there and support our local firemen. And uh, this Wednesday, we have a new person filling in for the Lent service. Uh, Del Neumeister, he's uh, part of Pastor Barry's church. And he is a retired pastor. And it's like one of the, it's like LCMC or Lutheran Brethren or one of those. I, I don't remember exactly, but... He's coming from a good background, so you'll get to meet him this Wednesday, and uh, uh, hopefully it goes well. I'll be in Delmont, so you won't see me around. That probably means it'll be a good night. So, um, what else do they have? Uh, I do have a prayer request, but are there any other announcements uh, or prayer requests before before I share that, and then we begin our service? We have, a, we have a couple different singing things going on this morning. Sunday school will be singing in the service, so keep an eye out for that. And then uh, uh, Tim is going to sing right before the sermon for us as well. So uh, We do have a prayer request for uh, Clint Knudsen and his um, uh, treatments for colon cancer. So we want to just keep him in prayer that way. That's a, that's a tough cancer to deal with, and so we hope that it's caught early enough and that the treatments will be effective. With that, I invite you to rise as you are able. And our call to worship this morning is from Psalm 121. I'll read responsibly together. I lift up my eyes to the hills. From where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord, who made heaven and earth. He will not let your foot be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade on your right hand. The Lord will keep you from all evil, he will keep your life. We open in prayer. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we Thank you so much for keeping us, for, for guarding us in your care, for the fact that you are always diligent, that you never slumber, you never go away on vacation, and you never neglect or forget or forsake your people. And so we thank you for that. Help us not to take that for granted, Lord. As we come into your presence this morning, we ask for your guidance, we ask for your wisdom, and we ask for your encouragement and your healing through your word and through our worship with and, and to you this morning, Lord. Bless us in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Congregation may be seated. Our opening hymn is O oh, Worship the King, number 170.
our confession of sin before our God. We bow our hearts and our minds before the Lord, confessing together, Almighty God, our Maker and Redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you. forgiveness of all our sins, and by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you, and of your will, and true obedience to your word, to the end that by your grace we may come to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sunday, and I, I always usually lean on this declaration of grace because of the two-sided nature of it, and it's going to come up in our sermon today as well. And so take to heart what God has done for us in declaring his grace to us today and what that means for us and also for others. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy upon us. He has given his only Son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. The promise of scripture is that whoever confesses his sins to the Lord will receive forgiveness through the faithfulness and righteousness of Christ. God grant that this may be the experience of us all. On the other hand, I declare to the impenitent and unbelieving that so long as they continue in their impenitence, God has not forgiven their sins and will assuredly visit their iniquities upon them if they do not turn from their evil ways and come to true repentance and faith in Christ before the day of grace ends. All that to say that if you confess your sins, God's forgiven you, and you need, you need to come into his presence, and all are welcome to come and be in the presence of Christ at communion because he's forgiven your sins and you're welcome. But if you're struggling and you're not forgiven, if you can't confess your sins and, and come broken to God, he can't heal you, and so you come to condemnation. So for most of us, that's not the case. We don't have to worry about that. But there's many friends and relatives and, and family and workers out there that may we pray for them and have them on our hearts today when we pray later this morning that they receive God's grace as well. So take that to heart. You may be seated. Our first reading this morning comes from the book of Genesis, chapter 12, beginning with verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father, father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their possessions that they had gathered, and the people that they had acquired in Haran, and they set out to go to the land of Canaan. When they came to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the Oak of Morah. At, the time, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, with Bethel on the west and I on the east. And there he built an altar to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going toward the Negev. That ends our Old Testament reading. Our New Testament lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, uh, beginning in chapter 4, 1 through 8, and then 13 through 17. What then shall we say was gained by Abraham, who we just read about a moment ago? Our forefather, according to the flesh, 
For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now, to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due, he has earned them. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works, blessed are those whose, whose lawless deeds are forgiven and whose sin are, sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs. Faith is null, if, for if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath. But there is no law, if, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. That is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, adherent of the law but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Here ends our New Testament lesson. I invite you to rise for our holy gospel text. The gospel text comes from the third chapter of John. We see Nicodemus coming to Jesus in the night here. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to Jesus, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Here ends our gospel text. We continue with our confession of faith, page 18 in our hymnal, the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of the Father. And he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the 
Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Continue our service with our offering. Invite the ushers to come help with that. Should teach the congregation that song, Steve. <laughs>
drawn us into your presence this morning. You're ministering to us, and we thank you for that. We, we return a bit of our time with you this morning. We return a bit of our treasures and our gifts and our talents, and we serve you this morning as well, Lord. And we ask you to put these things that we give to you to good service to you and to others. May you multiply our gifts and help them to be abundant beyond our expectations and give us wisdom and give wisdom to those who manage our talents, our abilities, our time, and our treasures. And bless us as you guard us and you keep us and protect us, Lord. Help us to not take that protection for granted as we lift up to you our, our children, our parents, ourselves, all the things that you've given into our care. We, we give those things to you in prayer that you might protect them and hold them for us and keep them safe in ways beyond what we are able to do. And help us to partner with you in that, Lord. Help us to uh, step up and do our part as well to maintain and, and stand by and hold to your truth and your wisdom and your guidance and instruction. Lord, help us to honor you in all that we do and all that we are as we live. Lord, we thank you this morning for the many ways that I feel blessed myself and I hope others here by the community that you've put us into uh, here at St. Peter. You've called us into this space and this time and this place and this history and this part of the planet. Um, and we thank you for that, Lord. We thank you for the healthiness of it, the connectedness of it. Help us to sharpen one another. Help us to correct and rebuke one another where necessary. But mostly help us to encourage one another. And as, as, just as the kids singing for us this morning was encouraging to us. Help us to take good care of that possession that you've given to us. Help us to pour into them knowledge and wisdom and, and understanding. And help us to also receive willingly and openly from them the encouragement that they give the joy that they have to give. Help us to not take those things for granted either. And as we celebrate this morning in many ways, we celebrate our children, we celebrate youth, and we celebrate life. And we're, we're thankful for Kathy this morning and anyone whose birthdays have been recently. And, and it, it, these times help us to remember uh, that life and new, new life beginning is significant. And, and not just our physical lives as well, but as we think of when we celebrate you know, new members coming into our fellowship, or we celebrate confirmations, or we celebrate baptisms, a reflection of the, the new spiritual life as well, or the renewal of our spiritual lives as well. Help us to not take those things for granted, but to, to lean on them for, for our comfort and peace. And help us not to take communion, the community of believers, and with you and with one another, Lord, help us to never take that for granted either. And in that sense, when one and when people in the community are suffering or hurting, Lord, help us to be strong for them. Help us to pray and lift them up to you on their behalf and for their healing, Lord. And we ask you to work in, in Clint's uh, doctoring, Lord, for his cancer and, and be with him. And, and especially not just physically, Lord, but just spiritually and emotionally as well. Be with him and any others that are, that are suffering with some type of illness or disease. And, and we think often as well of those who are recovering from things and backs and, and ribs as well and, and just getting old and, and our bodies getting less and less robust as we get older and, and so be with those as well who are still recovering from different accidents that they've had or different surgery procedures they've had um, bring them peace bring them visitors uh, bring them encouragement those who aren't able to get out anymore on their own or not as often bring friends to them give them good phone conversations give them good face-to-face -face contact with with people they know and love and can draw strength from Help us not to neglect them or take them for granted, but bring them people into their lives, ourselves and others, that they might be encouraged and that we may be also. Lord, whatever else remains on our hearts and minds this morning, whatever other distractions or, or our own things that we're struggling with, Lord, we turn them over to you now in this moment. may be seated and we continue with Tim I speak Jesus
that's always that awkward thing. Is, uh, it was awkward at Bible college. They would never allow us to clap in chapel for any group that sang or whatever. And, and, and as Tim, you know, as you guys were clapping, he, he motioned toward the altar appropriately so. And the, the, the struggle there as humans is we want to make sure we're not, you know, and Tim would agree with this. We don't want to elevate Tim. We want to elevate Jesus, who we just sang about. Um, but I, I do want to express appreciation for those who volunteered to sing or sacrificed their time to lead the Sunday school kids to sing and, and playing for the services and stuff. You know, Jeanette, as well as uh, Renee, who will be playing again for us in a couple weeks. And, and, I, and I really appreciate that. I, I love people sharing their talents and abilities. And, and uh, you know, even if it's been quite a while since you've played for us, Kim, you know, just saying, she's not really paying attention. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, Kim and Hannah and others who have, who have played or have sung or, uh, you know, I just really appreciate those things. I maybe don't always express it well or maybe we sometimes take those things for granted. But uh, I love when people can share their talents when they when God has placed on their hearts uh, uh, something that they can do for him and for others. Uh, I really appreciate those things. So uh, with that, I invite you to pray with me as we begin our sermon time here. Heavenly Father, bless us as we open up your word this morning. Uh, help us to take to heart what you are saying to us this morning through your service and through uh, this message specifically. May your Holy Spirit touch and interpret and, and explain inside our hearts and our minds what we need to hear from you today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, the downside to Tim singing is I wasn't up here getting my, my stopwatch going so I don't go too long especially on a communion Sunday. Uh, you will need to open your Bible, though, today um, because I'm going to go a little bit further in the text than uh, verse 17. We're going to at least include verses 18 and uh, probably 19 and 20 and 21. So John 3, uh, if you're using the Pew Bible, you're going to want to be on page 1055. If you have your own Bible, uh, good on you for bringing your Bible to church. I think that's a good practice. Um, if you're using your phone, I... I I understand I have a lot of Bibles on my phone and it's easy for me to do that. So um, this is a passage we're very familiar with. It's one that has come up in the rotation since I've been here. You know, this is, we're reaching the end of our fourth year here soon. And, and sometimes that seems like a lifetime. Sometimes that seems like a blink of an eye getting to know people that way. But um, we have touched on this text before. And so there's some things that I'm not going to revisit as heavily because I as our title implies, our focus today is going to be more at the end of the passage, um, by faith and through faith, and looking at what does that, what does that mean? What does this faith mean? Um, and I, this has come up as a discussion point in a men's Bible study a couple times in this last couple of years, um, doing a study on biblical men, and uh, today we're going to open that up here more fully. But what we have is at the beginning is we have a Pharisee, one of the religious leaders. This would also be one of the cultural leaders of, of the Jewish nation, if you will. They were under the authority of Rome, but the Pharisees, functionally, they were the government for the Jews. The Jews obeyed them and, and followed their laws, and then the Roman law was followed just for society in general. But day by day living, the Pharisees were those who were in charge. And I say that because... We tend to think of those, especially the Pharisees, we tend to think of them as all bad. And the reality is some of the leaders were good. And, and we can make that same case even today in our nation when we have, you know, the secular government we have. You know, not all of, we can't make a blanket stereotypical statement about any group in our nation. White people, black people, politicians, senators, Republicans or Democrats. You can't just say, oh, they're completely evil. Because it's all about individuals and where are the individuals. And in this case, we're talking about the individual Nicodemus, who was one of the Pharisees. And he is one that I, we can't, I'm not God, I can't say for certain, but I, I feel from the biblical text we can say that we will see Nicodemus one day in heaven with Jesus. And because he demonstrates that he trusted in Jesus and what Jesus did on the cross later, and we see that when he helps with Jesus' body after the crucifixion and resurrection. But the reality is, at this time in Nicodemus' life, he is one of the leaders, and he is a conscientious leader. He is a leader that seems to care. He is a servant leader. He is a leader who has a heart for God. And he's not just about his own power, or he's not just about himself. But at the same time, he is fearful. He comes to Jesus in the night. He wants to know more. 
And he shares a little bit of the reality of his heart when, he's, when he says in verse 2, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. He has observed Jesus, he has seen what Jesus has done, and he recognizes God and what Jesus is doing. He doesn't fully understand, hence why, why would he come to Jesus if he knew everything already? And so he's coming because he wants to know more. He, he's curious, he wants to have answers. And he comes with a, a, you know, an honoring statement. He calls him rabbi, which is a term of honor and a reflection of the hierarchy. Here's Nicodemus who could go to any of the normal people, any of the peasants, and he could demand and tell them to do whatever. He was in charge of them. He could, he could make them feel guilty or he could make them feel redeemed. He could make them feel shameful or he could make them feel good because he had that authority over their spiritual lives and over their daily lives. And yet he comes in submission to Jesus saying, Rabbi, you know, Jesus, you are my, you're a teacher to me. And he says, you are a teacher from God. He's honoring and, and noting Jesus' authority there. So there's respect and there's honor. We don't see that from the other type of Pharisee interactions that we have in the Bible. Jesus answers him, and, and not even directly to what he says. Jesus gets right to the heart of what, what is Nicodemus wrestling with. Jesus has a way of doing that. And so he says, unless one is born again. And what, what we must know is that when it says born again, the, the clever thing is when Jesus uses words, sometimes they mean one thing, they mean directly what they say but they also could mean deeper things as well. And so we need to be aware of that fact that when it says born again, it literally, that word can mean the same thing as again or from above. And so we could say unless one is born of heaven or from above or unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. It is impossible to see, to, to acknowledge, to understand the kingdom of God unless we are reborn in the spirit. That's significant. I think we sometimes maybe read through this passage quickly, and there's so much here that we, we focus on or that we grew up focusing on, especially John 3, 16, that we, we miss the fact that there is a severe consequence. If you are not born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Without the spiritual birth, without the Holy Spirit impacting and manipulating your life and in helping your heart and your mind understand, you cannot see God working. You cannot see his authority. You cannot see his rule over the world. You cannot see his kingdom. That is a fact. It's actually one that Lutheranism often clings to when we, we speak of the fact that you must be baptized so the Holy Spirit can come to you and allow you to see God's kingdom so that it's not merely just a head knowledge of, of facts, but it's something where you can literally see God working and you can acknowledge his working in your life and around you and in the world. And then Nicodemus responds in, in a more literal way. Or a, a, it, it, you have to realize that this, maybe we sometimes ridicule Nicodemus, but I think he is, he's asking the question that we're going to say, and I'll say here in a second. He's asking this question both seriously, but also with a little hyperbole, right? Like he asks this question and you know he's not being literal. And he says, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? I mean, he's, he's not being literal there. He's not being serious. He's using hyperbole because he doesn't understand, what do you mean by born again? You know, I, I can't be reborn. I can't go into my mom again. And he's using that to emphasize how ridiculous that is. Like, what do you mean a man must be born again? Like, what a ridiculous thought. Like, we, do I have to die and then come back to life or whatever? You know, there's so much tied up into that. And the Jews were vehemently against because God is completely contrary to any form of reincarnation or, or reanimation that way. And so there wouldn't be that aspect of the death and resurrection that way. But a rebirth, a physical rebirth, which is what Jesus even is kind of allu alluding to, but in a deeper sense. <clears throat> Jesus replies to that question this way. He says, unless one is born of water and the spirit, so we think of our birth, and then many of you are in calving season, and I was watching the, the Sunny Farms yesterday, on, and they, they were pulling a calf, and so I'm, I'm learning a little bit about your trade more indirectly and without all the smells and all the, the mud by watching it on YouTube. And, uh, but you're welcome to invite me out. I'll probably get in the way, but um, 
but I appreciate watching it on TV where, where I don't have to have the full experience. But the reality is, right, when anything that's born, animal or people, we are born of water. We come from the, the amniotic sac. We are literally born in water. And so there's that, that water birth and there's that flesh birth that every human being goes through. No one who has ever lived has not gone through that water flesh or that water birth. But then Jesus speaks, unless you are born of the water and the spirit, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so that's another truth bomb here, if you will, another main point to take away. You cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't, you can't experience it or see it or acknowledge it unless you are born from above, from the spirit. And you cannot enter God's kingdom. There is no way to enter God's kingdom apart from through God working. That, that language of God working the means of our being able to enter his kingdom will come into play in a little bit when we speak of faith. But Jesus continues, that which is born of the flesh is merely flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. And then he says to, to Nicodemus, do not marvel, do not wonder or be amazed at this that I said to you. Jesus quotes here, you must be born again. Now, what's significant to note here, and that we don't always pick up in, in English, is that he goes from speaking directly to Nicodemus and saying, singularly, you know, do not marvel at this. I said to you, Nicodemus, I'm telling you personally, one-on-one, -on -one, and then he says this statement, which is in the plural. He isn't saying it just to Nicodemus. He's saying it to every human being. You must be born again. You must have a rebirth and a reawakening that is spiritual and from of God. Because that transforms you from your sinful self. And then Jesus goes on to say in verse 8, the wind the, blows where it wishes. Now what you should also know is that the Greek word for wind is the same exact word for spirit. And so we can interchange wind or spirit here. Likewise, the Holy Spirit is often directly connected to wind, which is something that is living and active and moving, but we can't see it. We can feel it and experience it. We can think we understand it, but I, you can't tell me where the wind come, came from. You can't tell me where it'll stop. You can't tell me how it even began or how it builds. But we deal with the consequences of it all the time. Spirits, winds, are interesting things for, for consideration. But Jesus says, the wind or spirit blows where it wishes. And you hear its sound. You can acknowledge its presence, but you do not know where it comes from. You don't know where it goes. And so it is with everyone who is born of the spirit. <clears throat> they don't fully understand it. They don't know where it came from, but they are in it. And they are carried along by it. And they're directed by God wherever he wants to use them. And at this point, Nicodemus is kind of just... You know, at his end, he's kind of broken. And he says to Jesus, how can these things be? And then Jesus does kind of, you know, scold him a little bit here. Jesus answers him and says, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. And these are the things of God. The God's people should have understood this. We can look to the example of Paul later in the New Testament as well. Paul should have known better. He was zealous for God. He knew God and he thought he knew what God expected. And yet he was killing people because he thought they were blaspheming God when they were following Christ. And so the head knowledge isn't enough. You, you can be raised in the most religious home in the world, but at the end of the day, where is the spirit? What has God done in it, not you? And that's what it comes down to. Nicodemus was the teacher of Israel, yet on his own understanding, he <laughs> could not conceive the full truth here. Jesus continues in verse 11, we speak of what we know. And Jesus is speaking of himself as a bearing witness here, and him and his disciples and his apostles. We speak of what we know and bear witness to what we have seen, but you do not receive our testimony. Remember, we back up, and, and, and Nicodemus was saying to, to Jesus, uh, we have observed you doing things, and we can see that God is with you, and that God is blessing your work. But then Jesus says here, but you don't receive our testimony. You're seeing this, but you're not receiving it. You're not accepting that that is true. And how?
how much are we doing that in our lives? We see God's testimony in his word or, or godly people come into our lives. Are we receiving what God is giving to us so that then he can use us to do, other, to do things with and for him, for others? He goes on to say, if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the son of man, and as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. And there we see Jesus is, is you know, one-on-one -on -one with Nicodemus. He's straight out explaining to him what Nicodemus surely probably didn't understand in this specific instance, but would have understood more fully later when Jesus was lifted up and crucified and risen from the dead. And then Jesus goes on to say this, and this is where our title and main point comes from today, this following sections, that whoever believes in Jesus may have eternal life. And so what is the, what is the significance of that? Whoever believes, and remember I've told you repeatedly, and this is absolutely true, we can substitute belief, trust, and faith. Those words have the same significance, although the way we use them in practice in our culture, I think belief waters down the reality of it a little bit. And so I'm going to use the word trust more often and maybe faith as well. But that whoever trusts in Jesus may have eternal life. Can we understand that more practically, more applicable? Do we trust Jesus? I trust Jesus daily to keep my kids alive because I can't be there every moment. And I, I, oftentimes I can see ahead of what they're getting into. You know, I can see what they're, you know, oh, I, I understand what he's about to do. And I catch him. He's a dad, how did you know? How did you know I was going to do that? Because I was a sinful little boy too one day. Sometimes still am. Sometimes my wife will be that way with me. Hey, watch yourself. <clears throat> but I trust in Jesus that he has them in his hands. If something happens to them, he's got a purpose in allowing that to happen. I don't like those things when they've happened in my life. I look back on my past and there's many things I wonder like, why did you allow this in my life, Lord? Why did it take me so long to get to this point or to understand that? Why couldn't I have been better? But all he's asking is not to be perfect in my past. He's not asking me, asking me to be perfect today. He's asking me just to trust in him that he has a plan for my life, that he will provide me with what I need, food, clothing, shelter, Friends, companionship, partners through life, and all for the sake that I might gain eternal life. It's not all about this life or about comfortability, but it's about the next life. That whoever trusts in Jesus may have eternal life. If you lack trust in Jesus, that is not attainable. In the same way that you cannot enter the kingdom of God, you cannot see the kingdom of God apart from the Spirit. And we lean on these next verses usually for comfort, but they are very serious. They are deadly serious, and they are great comfort to those who are born in the Spirit. But they can be very fearful and condemning for those who aren't. Verse 16, we, we could probably all recite it, maybe in different forms, depending on the Bible version that you grew up with and learned it. But God so loved the world that he gave, he, he freely gave his Son to us, that whoever trusts in him, Whoever has faith in him, whoever believes in him, will not perish. And that word perish doesn't mean just, oh, I'm perishing from a lack of food. It literally means be destroyed fully. You know, whatever you're throwing in your burn pits, when you burn it up, right, it literally means that, that type of destruction. If you trust in Jesus, you will not perish. You will not be destroyed. But you will have eternal life. For God did not send Jesus Christ into the world to condemn the world. He will later. Later Jesus will come back and he will be fully condemnatory. Because it will be the final judgment. There will be no more grace at that point. And that's, that's the line in the sand. There is no more second chances. We are living in grace now. Do not take it for granted. But at that time, in that history, in our present time, we are in the days where Jesus has come. And he has come to save us. Well, what does that mean? He did not come into the world to condemn us, but in order that the world might be saved. And that word has a deeper meaning of, well, you have to understand, what were you saved from? And the, the deeper meaning of the word can mean saving, it can mean healing, it can mean preservation, and it can mean rescuing. 
and we go back to that word perish to understand what have we been saved from? We've been saved from utter destruction. We are all set apart for destruction because of our sinfulness. We are dirty, we are broken, we are unclean, and we are not worthy of a holy God. And we are deserved to be thrown into your burn pits and burned up and destroyed and smashed. But God says, no, I love you, I created you, and, and you're broken, but I want you to be made whole. And he does the work through Jesus Christ to take us out of the pit and then to begin healing us and preserving us and to making us whole, to rescue us from that destruction. And how is that done? It is done through him at the very end of verse 17. It is done through Jesus. It is done through faith in what God has done. And that is the significant thing to understand about faith. Faith isn't just me believing something is true. Faith isn't, faith isn't just trusting. It's, it has to have an object. You can't just say, I believe. I'm a believer. Okay, what do you believe in? I mean, what? You believe your tractor's going to start? You believe you're going to wake up tomorrow? I mean, that's fine. You, be, you believe some sports team is going to win? I mean, you can have faith, but it's meaningless. Except for what is your faith in? Your faith has to be in a person or a thing that has to do something and demonstrate something in order to be proven something worth having faith and trust in. I trust these chairs will hold me up each Sunday, and I plop down a chair. Like, I, I'm really anxious about breaking 100-year-old chairs because I, I'm often careless and not thinking when I sit down. And I don't want to be that person, the pastor that broke the 100-year-old chairs. You know, thankfully, old stuff is built well. It lasts a long time. But I trust without thinking that the chair is going to hold me up, that the pews are going to hold you up. We, there's a lot of trust that we have throughout the days that we take for granted. Maybe we trust in our spouse, and then one day our spouse isn't there anymore. Or we trust in our kids, and then one day they, they, they do something really stupid and they let us down. But trust always has an object, and if we're not mindful of where we throw our trust around, we can be taken anywhere, and our, tr tr our trust can just devastate us. But when our trust is in the one who created us and the one who can save us and preserve us, the one who can never let us down, the one who never fails, who never lacks strength, who never goes on vacation, who can never disappoint us, who will never leave us, whatever promise you look at in the word of God, he is there behind that promise. That is what our trust is in. And so now we continue in verse 18. So if you've opened up your Bible, you'll be able to read along. If not, you'll just have to listen. Mike is going potty, so enjoy that. Um, good comic relief there. Uh, whoever believes in Christ, whoever trusts in Jesus with their very life, is not condemned. If you want to be saved from your sins, you, you can't earn that. You can't come before the judge and say, hey, I did enough good things. I, I, I'm not going to get condemned. It laugh you out of the court because you're ridiculous. You have nothing to stand on. There's nothing you can do apart from trusting in the one who has done it for you. And in that sense, you will not be condemned because of his love for you and his gift to you. But whoever does not believe, whoever does not trust, is condemned already. There's millions of people around us in the culture in America, let alone the billions in the world that are out there who openly you know, in some cases, maybe they're a little bit, you feel pity because they're just ignorant. But there's so many who are openly not trusting and condemning and attacking God. And they are condemned already. Because they have not trusted in the name of the only Son of God. Those people that can't even speak Jesus' name unless it's a swear word. Or those, those who just vehemently attack him or rebel against him. They're condemned. They're going to be destroyed. That's not a, something to celebrate. That's not something to be happy about. It's a warning. He's warning people here. Part of the reason nobody is without excuse. God goes out of his way to warn. And this is the judgment, verse 19. The light has come into the world. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. We'll be looking at that, I believe, in one of our I Am statements. And people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light. They hate Jesus. They hate God. And you just see them running from God in our culture all every turn. To 
because they hate the light, they hate the truth. But they don't want to deal with the truth. And so they look for other things that make them feel better to overlook and, and to not have to deal with the abuse they had in the past. They, they, they go to other things instead of facing that and getting over it and letting God heal it. And so they hate the light. They do not come to the light lest their works should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light. They come to Jesus to be saved, to see the kingdom of God, to enter the kingdom of God. You have to come to the light. Jesus will not drag you kicking and screaming. He will not force you into the church or into the word. You have to come to him. You have to submit yourself to his teaching and to his relationship. And those that come to the light, they, they come and they may, they, it may be clearly seen that Jesus' works have been carried out in God. And so it's that faith, it's that trust, and that work of God that by faith and through faith we can enter the kingdom of God. That we can come into communion and not feel like we're going to get struck by lightning or destroyed by God. Because he says, come into my presence, receive my healing, receive my comfort, receive my salvation for you. We trust in him, through him, and in, with, and under him, we are part of that through faith in him. And with that, we get to participate with God in our salvation that way. So take that to heart this morning. May your trust, think about what you have trust in on a daily basis. Are you trusting in your job? Are you trusting in the weather? <laughs> Don't put trust in that. Are you trusting in other drivers, thinking of some of you guys that have to drive all the time? Are you trusting in your spouse? Are you trusting in your kids? It's good to have some level of trust in those things, but you must know every one of those things will let you down at some point. Are you trusting in yourself? I hope you are not trusting fully in all those things, but you are trusting in God. So that when you fail, when your spouse fails, when, when life fails you, God will be there to help you through that. And that you'll be open to him helping you through his people, through his word, through his instruction, through his love. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making yourself available to us. We thank you for working for us. We thank you for all that you do. Help us to be forever grateful. And then put us to work, Lord. Help us to respond so that others may receive the same healing and salvation that we have. So that we may not just rest on our, in our salvation, but instead look and see who else needs rescuing. Who else is worth reaching out to? Who else do we love as you loved us? Help us in that, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our service continues with the hymn, Oh, That I Had a Thousand Voices, number 223.
our service on page six with our communion portion of service. Dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament in a worthy manner, you should carefully consider that you what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you. This is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins. You should trust that Jesus Christ is present with his body and blood as the words declare. From Christ's words for the remission of sins, you should also believe that Jesus gives to you his body and blood to strengthen your assurance that your sins are forgiven. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, take heed, drink of it, all of you. This do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he has commanded, then you have properly examined yourselves and may eat Christ's body and drink his blood in a worthy manner. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for so great a gift, and should love one another with a pure heart, and thus, with the whole Christian church, have comfort and joy in Christ our Lord. To this end, may God the Father give you his grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We continue with our Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and after breaking it and giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. This do as often as you eat it in remembrance of me. In the same manner, after he had supped, he took the cup. And after blessing and giving thanks for it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This cup is a new testament of my blood, shed for you and for many, for the permission of your sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.
us give thanks and praise. We thank you, almighty and everlasting God, for having refreshed us with these, your gracious gifts. And we ask you for your infinite mercy and strengthen us in our Christian faith and support us in the trials of life and make us fervent in our love for you and to our fellow men. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Receive now the benediction of the Lord. May the Lord Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May he lift up his countenance upon you and give you his almighty and everlasting peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.